You are listening to By the Book, because if you don't look at the world through the Bible, you will never see it right. This is Alan Griffith. I want to welcome you to episode 53 of By the Book. Last time we talked about the elections because we are heading in that direction. I wonder if you did vote. Uh, I wonder uh, how things have turned out. I'm doing this in advance, so I don't know the results. But uh, voting, elections, extremely important. Now, we talked about those things kind of uh, in the middle of a series, and I want to get back to the series. We've been talking about the the human being, what we are. Most people don't understand uh, what they are, but the Bible tells us we are a, a tri-element being. We are spirit, we are soul, we are body. Uh, God is spirit. Angels are spirits. You and I have a human spirit. You and I also have a body. You and I also have a soul. Now, we've talked about the spirit. We've talked about the body. I want to focus in on the soul because this is the battleground of the day-to-day experience of of every person, and uh, it is the day-to-day experience of the Christian, the battle of the soul, how we function. Uh, how we handle life. And so I want to focus on these things. I'm going to take us to a passage of Scripture today that is somewhat introductory to the discussion. And the next time, by the way, we're going to take another break because we're at Thanksgiving time. I want to talk about that in the next episode. But I want to focus on a passage of Scripture today that Uh, I want to use to to serve as an introduction to the soul. Uh, The soul was complicated in the sense that sometimes in the Bible we are referred to as a soul. In Romans chapter 13, the Apostle Paul said, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. And he was saying, let every person, every human being, So in that sense, you are a soul. I am a soul. And that term is uh, described to, again, to to describe us as as a person, as a being. Uh, A being, by the way, that is going to exist forever. Now, animals have souls. They're not going to exist forever. You have a soul. You are going to exist forever because you also have that human spirit. And so the soul used sometimes to describe our very being. But then the term soul is also uh, used to describe certain aspects of our being, what I'll call the soulish aspects of our being. And we're going to be getting into a, a deeper discussion of that because that includes, number one, the mind, number two, the emotions, number three, the will, and number four, the conscience. And I want to tell you, that is the battle that you and I fight every single day, the battle of the mind, the emotions, the will, and the conscience. When I talk to folks, that's where we end up. And the marvelous thing and the wonderful thing is that I hold in my hands a book. I hope you have one in your hands, or at least nearby today, a book that tells me all about what I am and how I function. Now, you got people today who are running to psychiatrists and psychologists, and they're being uh, given antidepressants and all kinds of other medications. And I want you to know, while I appreciate such people who've devoted themselves to trying to help others, Few psychiatrists or psychologists really know and understand what a human being is and how we exist. And we need to know those things. Uh, I was just meeting with a, a couple today. My wife and I were out visiting a couple, and they're just, bless their hearts, they're all over the place in their their thinking and their emotions and uh, sometimes they yell at each other, tell each other they have to leave, and 
And, uh, you know, they're just yelling, screaming, battling, frustrated, into depression. I want to tell you something. People don't have to live that way. Uh, You don't have to live that way. Uh, Family members don't have to live that way. There's a God in heaven who has created us, and he tells us in the Bible what we are, how we function, how we are supposed to function, and praise the Lord, he's a God who can enable us to live the way he wants us to live. Now, we're never going to be sinless. We're never going to be perfect this side of heaven, but we can get tremendous victories when it comes to these areas. So today, again, we're going to talk about a a passage of Scripture that is going to introduce us to this uh, concept of the soul. And I hope if you have a Bible that you'll open up to Matthew chapter 16. That's where we're going to be. If you don't have a Bible in front of you right now, I hope you'll go back to Matthew 16 at some point and review the things that we are talking about. I'm going to try to set a historical scene. We are in the midst of the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to talk about that because that sets the stage for some very important things he says about the soul. Now, before we get there, let me comment on the term soul. The Greek term, the New Testament was written in Greek. The the Greek term is suke, suke. You would spell it P-S-U-C-H-E, suke. Now, here's what can create a little bit of difficulty. That term is sometimes in the Bible translated soul, but also at times it is translated life. And to get the the full meaning of a particular context, uh, we need to try to understand that term when it is translated one way, soul, or when it is translated the other way, life. The passage we're going to look at today has the term translated both ways. And so we need to give some attention to it and get hold of it. Uh, I hope you'll stay with me and think through this. This is important truth, certainly for every Christian. And if you're listening today and you've never become a born-again Christian, you need to do that. The answer, believe me, is not in church and religious practice or baptism or whatever so many people are involved in and counting on and trusting in. Your hope is in Jesus Christ alone. He died, shed his blood to pay for your sin, and you need to put your faith alone in him. Nothing else, no one else, Jesus Christ who died for you, arose from the dead to demonstrate that when he died on that cross, he did in fact pay for your sins, and now he offers to us the gift of eternal life by faith in him. So let's talk about, let's talk about where we are here in Matthew chapter 16. Beginning in verse 13, the Lord Jesus has been ministering at this point for perhaps two two to two and a half years. We're not exactly sure, but he's well into his, his ministry, his earthly ministry of presenting himself as the Messiah, as, as the King, as the anointed one, as the promised one. He had been in the regions of Galilee many, many times. He had gone down into Judea and to the city of Jerusalem. He uh, at one point passed through the regions of Samaria. And as we read in Matthew 16, far along in his ministry, but now a time for evaluation. And so he takes his disciples far to the north part of the nation of Israel. He's up near the Syrian border. He's in a little community called Caesarea Philippi. That's right up near Mount Hermon. And he gathers his disciples. And I want to read to you verse 13. It says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Now, I'm really intrigued by this passage of Scripture. 
because the Lord Jesus has been teaching, telling people who he was. He has been performing miracles, raising people from the dead, healing the sick, doing all kinds of things to give his credentials, to show people, I really am the Messiah. And so now he takes his disciples up to Caesarea Philippi, gathers them together, and he says, whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he asked his disciples, hey, you've been with me, you've been about with me, you've been talking to people. I want to know who those people think I am. Do they get it? Do they understand? And the response of the disciples is is amazing because verse 14 says this, and they said, some say that thou art John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist, as you know, was the forerunner of the Lord Jesus. He preached the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was trying to prepare people for the Lord Jesus to come. And now, by the time we get to Matthew 16, John the Baptist has been put to death. And so people are saying, well, maybe Jesus is like the resurrected John the Baptist. Maybe John the Baptist came back. Well, obviously that wasn't true, but that's what some people were saying. Others, verse 14 says, thought he was Elijah. Our text in Matthew 14 says, they said, uh, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah. Now, that's interesting because if you go to the book of Malachi, Malachi prophesies, excuse me, prophesies that someday John the Baptist, excuse me, I'll get it right yet, someday Elijah will come back, and he will come back to the earth before the great and terrible day of the Lord. Now, there's a day of judgment coming, and amazingly, the Bible tells us that John, excuse me, Elijah is coming back. So here some people said, well, maybe this Jesus is actually Elijah. Others thought maybe it was Jeremiah the prophet, that maybe he came back, or some one of the other prophets. Now, the reason this is amazing is people are are developing all their own ideas and ignoring what John the Baptist had taught, ignoring what the Lord Jesus had taught, ignoring the message of the miracles, and they didn't get it. They did not recognize that Jesus was the Savior, the Messiah. So in verse 15, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? So now he says to his disciples, you've been with me a long time. Do you get it? Well, verse 16 Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. The term Christ refers to the Messiah, the anointed one, the promised one, the one who God said would come and be the Savior and eventually rule and reign as a king. So Peter gets it. Thou art the Christ. You are the Son of the living God. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. Bar-Jonah, by the way, uh, means son of Jonah. So Simon was the son of Jonah. Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. So the Lord Jesus said, you know that because my Father has made it known in your heart. Verse 18, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I don't have much time to dwell on this verse, but as some of you might know that uh, the Roman Catholic Church uses this as the teaching that makes Peter recognized as the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. Well, far from it. The Lord Jesus said, I say unto thee that thou art Peter. Peter comes from the Greek term petros, meaning a small stone. And then the Lord Jesus said, and upon this rock, well, the term rock is not petros, it's petra, which means a large, massive rock. 
And he said, the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church upon this rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter was not the rock on which the Lord Jesus built the church. The rock was what Peter said. The rock was the truth of who Jesus Christ is. He is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and the Lord Jesus says, that's the rock upon which I will build my church. Now, it's important to recognize he had not yet begun to build his church. The church was not going to start until the day of Pentecost, and that would be after the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But he was going to build his church, but we are at an interim time. And what I want you to recognize is that the interim time was this. The Jews who had been hearing from Christ for, we'll say, two and a half years, did not understand who he was, and they indeed were going to put him on a cross, as we'll see in a few moments. The Lord Jesus is going to build the church, but he hasn't begun to build it yet. And so we're at an interim time in the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus. The Jews have rejected him. The church has not yet started. I'm going to read verse 20. I'm going to skip by verse 19 for a moment. It'll take too long to deal with it. But verse 20 says, Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Isn't that interesting? The Lord Jesus said, Look, from now on, we're not doing this evangelistic message. I don't want you going out telling people that I am the Christ. Wow. Now, why? Well, listen to verse 21. From that time forth, now, here's going to be information that nobody had been given yet. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. And so at this point, where he has asked his disciples, do people understand who I am? And they didn't. Then he begins to unfold the message of his coming death. From this time forth, he begins to teach and educate his disciples on the fact that he has to go back to Jerusalem. And when he gets there, he will suffer many things from the Jewish religious leaders as well as the people and that he would be killed, and also that he would be raised again the third day. So I'm trying to set this scene for us. We're not dealing with Israel, with the challenge the Lord Jesus is going to make in a moment. We're not dealing with Israel per se. We are not dealing with the church because it hasn't started but he's just dealing with these men, these disciples, as human beings. And I, I just want you to think about it, because this challenge that he gave them is a challenge for us. So, I want to jump down to verse 24. I hope you have your Bible. Again, if you don't, I hope you'll get it and get back to this passage. Verse 24 says this, then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man, that's generic, any person will come after me. Anybody going to come after me? The people don't even know who I am. But if there's people who really want to come after me, he said this number one, let him deny himself. Number two, let him take up his cross. And number three, he must follow me. Now, the Lord Jesus then begins to talk about the soul, the personhood of these men, the fact that they were a human being with a life to live. So, listen to verse 25. 
and then verse 26. He said this, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Now, a few minutes ago, I told you that the text we were going to look at is a text where we find this word suke, sometimes translated soul, sometimes translated life, and often referring to our total being as a person. And so it's here that we find the term suke translated life twice in verse 25, translated soul twice in verse 26. But I want you to think of it as having to do with their existence and your existence as a human being. So verse 25, listen. The Lord Jesus said, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Now, sometimes if you hear that, you know, save your life, lose your life, or he goes on, whosoever will lose his life for my sake, uh, you think of the physical experience and physical death. Oh, somebody loses his life. What do you think of? We think, well, he must have gotten killed. He must have died somehow physically. But the Lord Jesus wasn't talking about just the physical experience. He was talking about the experience of each one as a person. He says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. What's it mean? What's the question, really? Well, the idea is, whosoever will save his life for himself shall lose it. What are you doing with your life? your soul, your being. What are you doing? The idea is, are you saving it for yourself? Are you saying, look, I've got a life and I want to live it. I want to do what I want to do. I want to go where I want to go. I want to control my life. Well, you know what the Lord Jesus said? He said, if that's you, you want to save your life for yourself, then in reality, you know what? You're going to lose it. You see, you and I only find meaning in knowing God, serving God, and being surrendered to God. That's where you find meaning and purpose. That's where you find out why you exist. And if you say, well, I exist for me, I want to do my thing. Well, you know what? You'll never, ever find out why the God of heaven created you. Do you care? Now listen to what the Lord Jesus went on to say. He said, whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. Losing life there is not physical death. It's this, God, here's my life. God, here's who I am, and I want to surrender it all to you. I want to give it over to you. I don't want to do my own thing. I don't want to live out my own goals and my own self-designed purpose. Lord, I want to know why you created me. I want to know why I exist. I want to know why I exist not only now in this life, but I am going to exist forever. There is an eternity out there, and I'm going to exist in it, and I want to know the purpose for my existence. Do you want to know that? Does that mean anything to you? The soul, your life, your being. Why am I here? Why did God create me? Verse 26, now the term suke is going to be translated soul. And here's what the Lord Jesus said. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole 
world and lose his own soul. Now, many times that's related to salvation. And listen, you need to be saved. If you've never been saved, you need Jesus Christ as your Savior. But this is, in a sense, a a broader concept. I want to be careful how I say that because I don't want to confuse you. But listen to verse 26. Let me help you think it through. What is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? You know, there are some in the world today who I think would like to to own and run the whole world. Well, I hear of uh, George Soros and, and Bill Gates and, and some of these uh, people who are behind the scenes, but trying seemingly to get control of the world. Now, I don't know how old George Soros is. Uh, I think he must be in his 80s. But imagine this for a moment. <clears throat> imagine that the time came when that man did in fact gain the whole world. Think about that. Think if there was any man, now there's a guy called the Antichrist who's going to try to do this. He will not fully succeed. But imagine a a Soros or any man who would come to the point of saying, you know what? I own the world. I run the world. I rule the world. It all belongs to me. And then, boom, they die. And listen, everybody's going to die. The Bible teaches us we live about 70 to 80 years. Some live longer, some live less. But that's the range of human life. So the question is asked, well, what did it profit that guy? What did it profit that guy who gained the whole world and he ran it? For whatever, a year, two years, 10 years, he ran the whole world. He owned the whole thing. He could do whatever he wanted to do. And then bang, he dies. He leaves this life. He faces eternity. He is lost. He doesn't know God. He's lost his own soul. He has lost his being. He ran the whole world, but he never even found out why he existed. He never found out why God created him. He never really found out what the God intended purpose was for his existence. So what good did it do him to gain the whole world? And the answer is it did him no good. No good. God's purpose for our being. God's purpose for our life. You know, life doesn't end when we die physically. Every single person is going to exist somewhere forever. Tragically, there is a fire prepared for the devil and his angels, and there are, there are people who are going to go there because they will not come to Jesus Christ. But I suggest to you there are some who have come to Jesus Christ, and they are saved, they are born again, but they are still holding on to their life. They're running their life. They're doing their own thing, and they're totally missing the will and plan of God for them. They don't know. They don't have the slightest idea what God's purpose is for their existence. I don't want to miss that. I've often said the the thing I, I dread is the idea that someday when I stand before God, and we all will, that he would say to me, well, you know what? Here's the life you lived. And then he'd lay out my whole life, what I did, where I went. And then he'd say, but that's not what I wanted for you. I wanted something else for you. I don't want that. Then the Lord Jesus asked this question. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Well, let me tell you this. The answer to that is everything. I'd give everything. I'm willing to surrender everything so that I can know why I exist, so I can understand God's purpose for me. I don't want to miss that. So I'd give everything to know that. Now, the Lord Jesus said that if some man really wanted that, really wanted to come after him, He'd have to do three things. I'm going to mention them very quickly. Number one, he'd have to deny himself. If you're living for yourself, you're missing it. You don't have a chance. You got to deny yourself and surrender to the Lord. You have to take up your cross. 
The cross for the Lord Jesus was the the fulfillment of God's will for him. He came to this earth to go to that cross. Why did God put you on this earth? What is his will for you? What sacrifice might it take? I don't know. But you got to say, I want to know the will of God. I'm willing to do the will of God. And then you have to follow him. You get saved in a moment. Salvation is a gift from God. You get saved in a moment. But then you follow him for a lifetime. And that's the challenge. I want you to think about this term, soul. You have a soul. You are a soul. We're going to talk more about it. Lord bless you. Till next time.